education. Um, and I'm also working at UT Arlington's uh, Student Affairs Department. So uh, I do a lot of work, um, definitely worked a lot with the Multicultural Affairs Department and had the honor of actually working with Blaze, um, one of the student workers there. Um, and she's definitely a great um, voice for all of this. So just to start introducing um, with Blaze, since I personally know her, um, she is actually the new UT Arlington student body president. So very involved in the community. And uh, she serves as the UT Arlington NAACP political action chair. Um, so very involved in that as well. So she'll offer a great perspective and some insight too into kind of what's going on in the college realm of things. Um, and going off that too, we have Corey, who goes by Ori, Ben Lockridge. Um, and Ori is a teacher at Tarrant County College for Upward Bound. So uh, Ori can offer a lot of insight in that in the community college sector as well. Um, and then we have Pastor Kennedy Jones. And uh, Pastor Jones serves as the president of the Arlington Ministerial Association. Um, so we have another awesome perspective. Um, so each of our panelists uh, will have the opportunity to go more um, and introduce themselves um, as well in their first question and if there's anything else they wanna add. Uh, so I'll go ahead and uh, get started. So we have the questions and um, I'll just like uh, call on each panelist and we'll switch off on who goes first for a question. So the first question is just, what is on the forefront of your mind as we gather here today? Um, and I will go ahead and give it to Ori first. Hello everyone. Uh, for me, it's the fact that I am not only black, but I'm also gay and Jewish. So when it comes to the issues, I see it as not just a single community's issue, but multiple communities issue. That because there are Jews in the black community, then a black issue is a Jewish issue um, because there are black, you know, thousands of black Jews. And when there is an issue in the black community, there's also an issue for feminism because there are millions of black women. So I really want to um, call for everyone to stand together and have some understanding, um, especially, you know, right now the whole world is seem like we're falling apart. So we really need to unite and we'll definitely remember this time. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we'll go to Pastor Jones. Pastor Jones, can you hear us? Okay, that would be me. I guess I'm next. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I think this is the pivotal moment for, for change. But the change must be quantified. Um, we must take the creative energy that we see today to bring about the change that we see. I think most people, they, they see the problem. They know the problem. They, they've, known the pro they've known about the problem for a long time. And what we see today is that that, that boiling point where we can do something and, and, and what, we, what we have to make sure is that we don't miss the moment. You, you, you can do something that does not properly address or solve the problem and our, our children or grandchildren will revisit this same issue. And, and what we don't want to do is we don't want to leave this moment for, for them to have to address this same thing. I often think about the founding fathers of the United States and, 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 and they talked about the unfinished business that successive generations would have to resolve. Well, I, I think this is our moment for this issue. And, and I was talking to the uh, city council person that is over this district and, and I told him, I said, Dr. Nunes, the prevailing winds are in our favor. And because you're on the city council and because of the position that, that, that my church holds in the community and, and the position, and as a result, the position I hold in the community, if we do not fix this problem substantially for ourselves and for our children, then there is only one place to look. That's in the mirror. 
So to me, the issue of today is fixing the problem so that we don't have to revisit this again in 10 years or 15 years from now. Thank you, Pastor Jones. And Blaze, um, feel free to answer as well. Um, so really what's at the forefront of my mind is I can't like shake the feelings of like, I just wish we could really get it together. Like as a country, I really wish, you know, like everyone feels that way. And then, you know, a lot of black people have this feeling of I'm tired of being tired, but we kind of have to use our plight and turn that into action and turn it into energy to make stuff happen. But if it wasn't just us, you know, turning that into energy, we could get this done a lot faster. So I just have those feelings of like, man, I wish we could get it together. And I saw something on social media, like to the effect of like America disguises itself behind, you know, the land of the free and the home of the brave. And that's really what it feels like sometimes, you know, we hide behind like, the glitz and glamour and like stereotypes of America and like people just feel like we have a great like great traditions and history and all this kinds of things but it's like we're ignoring the elephant in the room we have so much work to do as a country and for people just to like fall back on oh well this is the best country in the world that you could be in you can go somewhere else and you'll see how hard it really is like no, we need to address the problem like right here today, the things that are still affecting people today. Um, so that's really what I'm feeling like right now. Thank you all for um, sharing those very great thoughts. Um, so yesterday we had Dr. Jason um, Shelton, also from UTA in the Center of African American Studies, um, give a great presentation and it went over um, some statistics and different issues um, with racism in the U.S. today. Um, and so the next question is just to give you all your voice um, and chance to add. So um, can you talk about some of your own experiences with explicit or implicit racism? Um, and I'll go the opposite way, so I'll start with Blaze this time. So because of where I'm from um, and where I am now, I've I have experienced more covert racism, like, you know, not very blatant in your face. Um, I'm from Houston and I'm from an area of Houston where they call the internet, they call it the international district. So really diverse. And then when I, when I came to UTA, I was surprised to find out that it was so diverse. So I was kind of able to find, you know, my niche, my group of people and feel comfortable within that. But as I'm getting older, you know, I'm starting to notice the things that people say and do. So it's not, you know, people calling me names to my face. It's more so questioning my ability, um, not taking me seriously, not listening to me, making comments about my hair, um, people being surprised at my intelligence. And one thing that I heard a lot growing up is, you know, when I was younger, you sound white or like you, you're doing this, you're doing that, you know, associating positive qualities uh, with being white, um, you know, saying that black people are usually the opposite of that. Um, you know, it kind of hit me for the first time. I, I worked at Whataburger. That was my first job. I was 16 and I was always at the front taking orders, never in the drive through. And so this lady came up and she was like, Hey, um, I want the fish sandwich or something for my son. And I was like, okay. And then she was like, does it have MSG in it? And I was like, no, it doesn't. And she was like, do you even know what that is? And I was like, like, I know I'm a teenager, but like my, my entire job is to just know about the food and put the orders in the system. Like, that's it. It's not very complicated. But as I thought more about it, it just kind of took me aback. And I was like, wow. And then it'll be things like, you know, you know, like teenagers don't have a lot of stuff to do. So when I was younger, especially when I met my boyfriend, we would like hang out at the park or just sit in a parking lot and talk, you know, we didn't have a lot to do. And multiple times, I was so surprised, cops stopped us and were like, what are y'all doing? We were like, nothing, we're just talking. And they were like, oh, are you sure that's all that you're doing? Kind of looking around in the car, can I see your IDs? Like going back to their cop car and stuff like that. And 
he lived he lives in a nice neighborhood in a nice part of Houston and I was just like wow you know like I don't know I never thought I would experience something like that because I hadn't up until that point I was kind of shielded from it so it really surprised me but now like I said earlier I'm noticing these things more and more and each time like I kind of take a moment like how am I responding to this what can I even do to combat this I'm not going to talk back to a cop of course and what happens when it's something like my professor or somebody else like in a position of authority and not my peer it's harder to call stuff out like that and it can actually backfire on you so that's more of the things that I've experienced thank you so much blaze um and then pastor jones well i'm, I'm a little bit older than blaze and ori um so I, i've seen racism uh in a lot of different faucets uh, growing up in actually i i, I hail from uh, alabama in what a region of the country that's called the Black Belt because of the richness of the soil, but also it's heavy concentration of African Americans there. And um, it's actually the, the home of the civil rights movement. And we, we got a chance to see racism as a, a system. And, and there was like a code you lived by. And, um, the, the, the code required you to know the position and place of black people and the position and place of white people. And the code worked well until 19, till the 19, late 1950s, 1960s, when African Americans um, decided that they weren't going to live by the code anymore, that we were going to live by the code that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was gonna be the code. And we started pushing for the rights that um, we were, that should have been ours by birthright. And, and we started fighting for those rights. And, and in, in the midst of that, Dr. King came along and he helped to, 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 to give a framework to that movement. But the people that actually did it, the people that actually made the difference, they were, they were sharecroppers. They were farmers. They were maids. And so, um, and, and you guys are familiar with the story. They're the ones that gave legs to the civil rights movement. And, and, and in that time, um, because of those people that made the difference and said that we're gonna uh, bring about voting for African-Americans, they, they typically pay the price. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on this. Uh, I, I noticed that my, um, the chairman of our Deacon Board, Cecil McDowell, he's also on this line also. He's from Selma, Alabama. He was in Selma, Alabama during that same time. My father was in Selma, Alabama during that march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And, um, you know, it, it, it required making a sacrifice. The, the sacrifice that my family made is that, you know, we lived in one location in this house. And when my father engaged in civil rights, they gave him an option. Uh, you can live in this house or we'll build you a much better house and give you the land but you've got to cease from the civil rights activity you are doing. Um, my father made the decision, consequently seven days later, we had to move uh, and, and, and we did. But the, the, the thing that I remember most that, that shaped my, my, my mindset and my memory of the civil rights is that it was not just African Americans. It was African Americans. It was white. It was Jews. Uh, it was Catholic. Um, one of the men that saved my father's life in a very difficult incident when he was beaten within an inch of his life was actually a white guy. 
and 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 I remember it, him, him him actually saving his life. Um, I remember um, in Selma, there were when when Dr. King put out King, there were Jewish rabbis that came. There were Jews that were a part of the the civil rights struggle that framed it. And so you know when 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 we worked on the movement here in Arlington, and and, and I issued a call for help. You know, I issued a call for all men and women of goodwill to come. And in my experience, I think this last experience, which we, we, which I have had, is that they came. They came as black. They came as white. As a matter of fact, there were more white that came. Uh, we had a movement of march of around three thousand people, and they were actually probably seventy percent white. So my my the thing that I look at in terms of making change, which we were able to make change in the 60s, is because we had a movement, not of one group of people, but of all people. Thank you. Um, Ori, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes. Um, besides the regular explicit racism, such as I, I was helping my martial arts master move one day into a new place, and his neighbor yells, there goes neighborhood, as if I was moving in with him and, you know, oh, no, we have black neighbors. Um, there have been moments in my life because of, how, again, how um, I've been raised and my unique, um, I guess, combination. I've experienced things like I've been on dates with white guys. And as I was paying for the check for both of us, he looks and sees that I didn't leave a you know, black leaf tip, and I didn't know what to say. I was like, um, is it true white boys pay for their own food? Like, you know, because here I am trying to be kind and pay for both of us, but it's like, really, dude? So, and he didn't think anything wrong with that. He, was, he felt like he was just asking a question, but I had never heard of something that, that crazy. Um, and it reminds me also of, um, because of my, again, my family not being two together, I was adopted by a Hispanic family and the pastor was, or the father was also the pastor of a Baptist church. And I guess he felt because he had a black son, he could make more jokes openly. So like one of the jokes he told was um, that the angels were in charge of making black people and they left us in the oven too long and messed up our hair. So we ended up um, giving, uh, God gave us rhythm in exchange. Um, also, I guess in the, like one of the worst ones, he used to say, you are my son. If I had 20 more dollars, you would have been full Mexican. And I was like, wait, are you, that, that's so, you know, you're actually saying black people are like the worst, even in that kind of line of work. It's like, again, because he said he, it said that because I was an adopted son. It just, you know, that's hurtful and wrong no matter who, you know, who's around, but yes. Thank you. And you cut out a little bit. It was enough to where I think we all heard it, but um, just in case you need to check your internet, um, I know it's like Wi-Fi is an issue <laughs> like a lot of times. So um, the third question is, what do you say to someone who says the civil rights movement was successful and while we aren't perfect, we don't have widespread racism or discrimination anymore? And I will go ahead and start with Pastor Jones. Okay, what do I say to people to say the civil rights movement was um, successful and, and that we do not have uh, widespread racism? Um, I'd say that uh, that is absurd. <laughs> Um, we, we, we don't have the problem we had back then. And, and I lived through it. Uh, Dr. Dennis Wiles was the first Baptist. He's a friend of mine. Dennis was actually in Alabama. He was in Birmingham at the same time. We talk about it. Um, we do not have the type of racism that, and the, the expression of racism that we had back in the 1960s. But you know, there's, there's a difference between having a, 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 a deep scar and having, having a wound. And, and one requires immediate attention. And the other one, you, you, you may be able to live with it, 
but it it doesn't heal and it just it just gets worse and you can you can cover it with salves but if it doesn't if it doesn't heal it just continues to get worse year after year and so um, is it something that's life threatening uh, probably not but it's something that agitates you and it's always there and you know that is always there and 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 you and, and as long as it's there you know that you are not whole and 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 i look at the changes that we made in the 60s we made substantial progress there's, there's no doubt about that I, I i hear some people they go too far and say well we haven't changed no i promise you we we have changed i live in a different world so and that world doesn't that world does not exist anymore but where we are is is still not we have not reached the, the 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 calling or the ideals of the the founders of this nation a, a nation where men are judged based upon their character a nation where every individual has the right to live to the full level of their potential irrespective of color or ethnicity or economic status with that they started with so those things those things have not we have not achieved but you know i i, I look at it like this they fought their battles in the 1960s my father those that general they fought their battles and 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 it is left now to this generation to fight theirs the, the idea that you will be just handed a, 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 a paradigm of perfection is not what this country was ever framed on. And so you must fight that. One of the things that, that I did is, as, as, I, as, I, as I, I looked at the, 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 the kids and, and the folks, and, and, and Blaze, I hope you and Ori don't get offended because I call you kids, but I, I looked at the way you guys were marching and demonstrating, and I gone down to uh, Fuzzy's taco place, get a grab a cup of taco. And I, and I saw, it was a large demonstration in the street in the, of, the, of the kids. And the thing that I thought about is that they were like sheep without a shepherd. There was passion, there was desire. And, and on, on, on that night, I went back to the office and I framed what is called the Proclamation for Equal to Protection and Treatment under the law and then using your creative energy which you had already displayed i called the summit of the mayor the sheriff the district attorney president of the chamber of commerce and the uh president of the naacp now that summit would not have happened if it hadn't been for young folks like ori and blaze and because of your energy, your passion, and because of your demonstration in the street, they came. And in that proclamation, it laid out fundamental change, concrete steps that needed to be taken. And guess what? They said, you know what? We can make this happen. What I did was give substance and legs of legislation to the passion that you had exhibited and demonstrated on the street. And that was my calling because I knew how to do that. And therefore, what you did, and I, and, I, and, I, and I mentioned many times, what you did gave weight and force for me to bring up, for me to put forth legislative actions which the city of Arlington has now done. Thank you, uh, Ori. Um, I would say that racism takes different forms and different cycles. Like after slavery, you had um, the 13th Amendment that said that slavery was a punishment, which started black people being seen as criminals so that they can continue the institution of slavery. Then you had Jim Crow laws after Reconstruction. And um, even after the Jim Crow laws are, have ended, I would say look at any institution and see does it unfairly marginalize or target different groups. Because you have the war on drugs, you have the idea that um, all black people are criminals, and it seems like it's a normalized thing 
but it's still very racist in the sense of, you know, uh, this, op this stops opportunity for so many people by them going to jail. They cannot vote. They cannot uh, live in certain communities. They, it's hard, hard for them to find a job and um, just to have a family. They're more likely to go back in to the system afterwards. So this um, racism hasn't changed. It's almost so under the radar that people consider it normalized which we definitely have to shake back up because it's never really, it's never normal to be racist. Thank you. Thank you, please. Um, Ori said a lot of the stuff I was gonna say, like he really hit the nail on the head. Um, just because someone does not personally experience it or doesn't see it as much, doesn't mean that it's not there. And that seems like a simple concept, but you know, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Um, there wouldn't be such a large scale public outcry if the civil rights movement was so successful and everything's fine now. You know, from blatant prejudice like to someone's face, to voter suppression, to mass incarceration, to redlining, you know, all these things um, are still happening. So yeah, we're not getting hosed down in the street anymore, but now we're getting tear gassed. Like, okay, yes, schools are integrated, but they're still segregated. And, you know, Black people aren't enslaved anymore, but then they're thrown into prison and they work for the government and private prisons for very little to nothing. So racism is not eradicated by any means. It's just taken on different forms as time has gone on. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, those perspectives. Very appreciated. Um, so the next question kind of goes with that. Um, we're going to be talking about some terms that I just wanted to define for anyone that isn't familiar with them. Um, so one of the terms is systemic racism. I'm sure you've heard that around, um, but it really is just that racism is intertwined within um, the system. So it's not, you know, kind of its own entity. It's just um, within everything um, kind of in our culture um, and allies, which is a person um, that, you know, stands with you um, in terms of this. So the question is, what do you look for in allies against systemic racism? And I will go ahead and begin with Ori. Um, for me, at your role to help as Again, someone consider one of your people. If one of you know quote blank people say says something that is outrageous, I believe I've not done for black community or in any community. If you know that there's something that you know to be false, and to clarify that, it's almost as if people of that group can no longer talk for themselves because the media will say, oh, that's just them wanting you to believe their own interests. And that's, you know, again, far from the truth, but you would have to be someone that is of that people group to come forth and say, this is wrong. And here's why from our perspective that I believe it will be more believed. So it's, it will be more, they'll have more weight because they have nothing to gain from saying that I support black people um, based on what has been already in the works of what's been told about the fake news and how black people act. So just honesty and willing to stand up for the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Blaze? Um, so some concrete things that I look for in an ally. Number one, people that are willing to learn. And a lot of the times, I know people are coming from a good place, but they'll be like, well, where do I start? What do I do? And it's kind of like, it's not Black people's responsibility to tell you what's going on and how to help, you know? And it seems kind of rude to say, but like Google, like you look up, you Google like how to bake a cake, how to do this, how to do that. Look up the history. We had to look up our own history because it wasn't taught in school. So it's like, there are things like you can start on your own, by all means, ask questions, look for guidance, but just giving the excuse like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like, that's not good enough. That is not good enough. Um, the second thing, people that are ready to, that are willing to empathize and not sympathize, we don't need your sympathy. Like, we know this is bad, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> 
So we need you to like turn that into action. Don't, don't just be like, oh, I feel so bad for you. Like, yeah, me too. Now help us. Um, another thing, people that realize their privilege and use that for good. So you have to realize that by not being black or that by being white, you are, you're afforded certain things that black people aren't. So it's your responsibility to use that to help push the movement forward. Like you have power with that privilege and you could be using it in a productive manner. Um, and the last thing, one that I honestly think is the most important and it's, it's a good place for people to start after they've educated themselves. You know, call out people in your lives, call out your family and your friends who are being racist. We're saying those prejudiced things are always making those jokes. Like, it's not funny. That's how these things get perpetuated. That's why people think it's okay and they'll go out in these public spaces. They won't even know it, but they're perpetuating microaggressions. They're discriminating against people. They're believing stereotypes. It starts off as innocent, I believe, sometimes, but then it turns into something different. So I feel like calling out those people in your lives um, and explaining to them why that behavior is not okay is one of the most important things in being an ally. Thank you, and Pastor Jones. Okay, let me first say that uh, Ori and Blaze have given some outstanding responses. Now, let me ask the question, let me ask you to give, ask me the question again so I can make sure that I do address your question. Yes. So the question is, what do you look for in allies against systemic racism? Okay. Um, well, the, the, the way I look at it um, is something that, that Dr. King once said. And actually, it was, it was coded. People thought he was, he was reciting a poem. He really was. Um, he said, if you can't be a tree on the top of the hill, then be a bush on the side of the mountain. You can't be a brush on the side of the mountain and then be grass at the foot of the hill. So, and whatever you are, be the best that you can be. Now, you listen to that and you think, oh, he's just telling you as a person, be the best person you can be. But, but th for those of us that were in the struggle, we heard something different. And, and what that was is, look, you may only be able to help me in certain areas. I'll take that. Um, you know, you may be able to help me. In letters, hurry stuff, or take people to the poll. I'll take that. Maybe the only thing you can do is pray. You know, I'll take that. Uh, if you're not against me, then you're for me. Uh, th there were enough people then, and, and I know even now, they're against you. They, they, they are against the, 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 the movement toward a more just and equal society. Now, some are not against it because of racist ideology. They're just against it because they don't like seeing the status quo change. And, 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 and that's fine. It's just that it's unacceptable to me <laughs> because of where I am. Maybe if I was where they are, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd feel the way they do. But unfortunately, I'm where I am. So therefore, their position is untenable to me. And so, you know, I, I look for I, I, allies come in different shades and colors and ethnicities. That, that's what I've learned. And, and, and wherever you can get some help in an area, you, you take it. Now they may not, they, they, everybody doesn't food, that does not fit everything that you need, but collectively everybody together will find the solutions and the pieces of the puzzle to, to put it all together to bring about the change that we seek and 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 what we have to do, I believe, or or let let those people that really find their spot, we we gotta let them shine. Because because what we what we what we have to be careful of not doing, especially those of my generation, of thinking, okay, the young people have brought it to this point, now it's time for us to take over. No, don't 
don't I don't agree with that. I believe that some of these young folks are going to be that, that no, they're not going to be. They are incredible leaders right now. And we need to let them do that. And then those spaces where we are, you know, back in the 60s or in the 80s, I may have fitted in this spot. Okay, today I'm over in this spot, and that's fine. And because somebody else is in, in, in that spot over there, and, and that's fine. Or it may be that I go from being out on the, out on the streets demonstrating to behind the scenes writing documents that help to bring the help that help to quantify the change because what the folks want that are marching and the people want that are praying is for there to be sudden the change that we don't have to revisit again. We won't finish it. That's the thing I did learn. We won't we won't finish it. But you know what? We'll, we'll get a whole lot further down the road than where we are today. Just like we are a lot further down the road than where we were in the 1960s. And, and, it, and, and you can find help. What you, what, you, what you can hamstring and you can cripple yourself if you try to find help only among black people or only among men or only among a particular ethnic group. You, you'll cripple yourself. Help comes from a lot of different places. And you have to be willing to see it and accept it for what it is at that moment in time. Thank you all. That was very insightful. Um, and I definitely learned a lot from that too. Um, so we were talking about the system um, and systemic racism. So within our system, we have different categories. We have the law enforcement, we have uh, the education system, we have movies and entertainment. So I was hoping you all could talk about uh, what parts of the system do you think are an urgent, immediate need for reform and why? And we'll start with Blaze. So all the way I have notes, if I'm looking down, that's what I'm looking at because I have important things to say. So number one, um, housing. So black neighborhoods are subject to poor housing and over policing. So this hinders your everyday life and even your health. You know, black neighborhoods are more likely um, to have high levels of pollution and they're more likely to be plagued by food deserts. So, you know, this affects your everyday life. It's not just like, oh, when I try and do this. No, it's right there at home. Uh, the second thing, education, which ties into housing, you know, it's unfairly, I believe, determined by property taxes. So we need good education and the proper resources to succeed in life. Like, I don't have to sit here and tell y'all the value of having a college degree. Everybody knows that. So we need to be afforded those same opportunities because, for example, coming from my high school in my district, I was, I was doing good, you know, I was in the top 10%. I was like, this is going to be a breeze. And then I came to college and I was like, oh my God, like I was so unprepared. And that's how these communities are. You know, they're, they're not preparing their kids for college. Uh, either it's because, you know, they don't really believe they're going to get all the way there or two, because they don't have the resources or a combination of the two, you know, so that really hinders you know, our growth in society. Um, and the last thing is the criminal justice system as a whole. And again, the previous two things I talked about tie into this. You know, we can't break this cycle that we're in if we're constantly being targeted, imprisoned at high rates, sentenced unfairly, and then being killed by police. Like, we just cannot move forward, you know? Black men are incarcerated at such a high rate. Like it's, people have, like when I watched 13th, the documentary by, uh, directed by Ava DuVernay, you know, the way that she described it, she was like, black men are going extinct. And it's true. Like that's actually happening because they're imprisoned at such high rates. So all of these things are interconnected. And if we remedy or help one area, that's good, but until, all these things come together and are fixed, you know, we're not going to get very far. We have so many areas <laughs> that need help, really all of them. Uh, but I believe these are our top three. Thank you, Blaze. And Pastor Jones. Okay. Um, what was your question again? 
Sure. Um, so we're asking what parts of the system do you think are an urgent, immediate need for reform and why? Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm really happy with Blaze's answer because he looked beyond what I consider to be the shiny object, which is uh, police reform, um, to look at those issues that are also systemic in our society, such as education um, and, and uh, nutrition, which are areas that we as a society, we can fix that. We can fix that. But you know, there was something that Blaze touched on that is bigger than race. It's about economics. We, we have a society that is becoming oligarchical in its nature. Where you have a few people that have ridiculous wealth. And then you have the vast majority of Americans who are struggling to get by. And there's something, even the founders knew that there's something fundamentally, inherently wrong with that because of the basic nature of humanity, of, of, of man. It, there's something, it, it will lead to a destructive pattern. And so I think that we, we, we need to fix, and one of the ways is through education, and the other one is through a reallocation of wealth, which can be done, you know, using educational means. And, and, and paying off student debt and then making it possible for kids to go to school, I think we help the society and our nation as a whole by doing that. And, and, and we, can, we, can, we can put in a caveat that say for children of color, there is, an, there is an advantage that they have because they have borne the brunt of the uh, misbehavior in our social program that we've done. The, the thing is, is that um, white kids have not born, they, 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 they have not, they have had advantages that children of color have not had. That's just a reality. And so if you want to fix it, then you've got to go back and do it, deal with that. Now, let me say something on the issue of policing. The, 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 because that is the, the shiny object that has really ex cre created the explosion in which we're seeing. We, we can call it racism. And, and I think that a, a portion of part of that it is racist. But I think also it's just the, it's just the inherent nature of individuals. We, we as a society, instead of implementing the, the resources to deal with certain issues like homelessness, mental illness, instead of uh, putting the money into areas to deal with that, what we do is we take the easy way out, just we let the police take care of it. Let the police take care of it, okay? They're not trained to do that. They are not prepared to do that. Police are prepared, trained to keep the peace, and if I want to be crazy, they are hired killers. They, their job is to take, if necessary, in the life or threat against the rest of us. So that when we, when, when we ask them to come in to a school and, and help out, or we, 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 we see someone who's got a mental illness, they're just running around the park, and, and we send them, and then we are surprised that they perform according to their training because they see the person in, in, around, running around the park that's half naked as, as a threat, or they see the kid in the school as a threat, well, when they do, their training says, if you see a threat, this is the way you respond. I, I, during um, one of the NAAC meetings we had, and the, the, we're getting a new chief of police here in Austin, and, and I'll say this so that, so that Ori can, can take over, but the, 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 what they said is, we want to make sure that the chief of police and the superintendent of um, education have a good relationship. And I thought about that for a second. And a year ago, two years ago, I, would, I probably would have second that. But in that moment, what I thought about was like, no, I don't. I, I don't want the chief of police to have any relationship with the superintendent of education. I don't want any of his boys own the property of the school. 
because that's not what they're trained to do. We, we, if, you, if, if you got issues with kids, I'm really, then get you a security force that deals with handling kids. Because if the police are there, they're gonna do what they're trained to do. And that's gonna lead to more kids having a record because they're not part, they, you intertwine those two systems that have no business being intertwined. Used to be a time when we said that until a kid was um, uh, 18 years old, whatever they did, you, you, you didn't hold it against them. They're, they're, at 18, their record was clean. They took off. They, they, they had, a new, a new, uh, had a clean slate because of the nature of a kid. That hasn't changed the nature of, of children and the intellect that they use or lack of it. But what we have done is try to intertwine a, a system with, with in, in, in areas it has no business being intertwined. And, that, and that, that falls on us as a society for, for allowing that to happen. Thank you. And Ori. Uh, I believe that education and entertainment are, should be the main places that should be reformed. Uh, I say this as a uh, black man and a Jew. You no, know, I, my people were twice a slave and looking at that, I'm trying, I was trying to see what's, what was the difference that, um, that happened. And for me, it was the leaving and receiving, you know, the Bible, the, the Torah that was, that changed the culture because, before, if you look at the, you know, the golden calf, they went, they were trying to go back to what they knew because that's all they knew to slavery and how their masters were. So they, without any guidance, they went back to that mindset. And there's a reason why the word, e the word for Egypt is also the word for ignorance in, in Hebrew, because that's an ignorant mindset trying to go back to your slave mentality. So, um, people they were in reconstruction of the start uh, teaching and telling black people that they're still lesser. Think of um, the, who Jim Crow was. Jim Crow was a, an actor, a white man who would dress in blackface and, and that crazy. So this is something that has been educated throughout black people for years, that uh, they're still slaves, they're still lesser. The fact that Juneteenth is recognized as a formal holiday is a sign that black people really aren't seen as valuable, still have them, you know, we're not going to educate them about their history and culture. Slavery wiped out any form of black culture, so African Americans don't have any. And I say um, in education of black culture in schools needs to be done. And Entertainment is a form of education. You know, it's just how society learns what, what goes on, what's, long, what's wrong and right. So having criminals, um, you know, and in movies always be black, the thug mentality, where are blacks doing, you know, HBO shows, not only watching what cultures, but we don't have tribal dances anymore. We don't have know um, anything that is something that any other culture would have but something that you know is beyond us so this is all we have is it the meager scraps i can honestly say until the black lives matter movement in all the press there were so many acts that they heard mark is god um and um so many others who had never been touched on uh in school so i highly would recommend that media and education would take the notion of black skin as something to be proud of, not in the entertainment and negative sense. Because we, again, we never changed from being the, the Jim Crow white man in a sense, because we're relieving a culture that is not ours that another group has made for us. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, my audio is cutting out. <laughs> You're good. Um, I was just thinking, yeah, like sometimes it helps if you turn off the video while you speak because like it just can't handle all of it, but then you can like have your video on otherwise. I don't know if that will help, but it might. 
Um, <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. I, I don't have to do the whole spiel over. <laughs> no, you're good. I think we heard enough. It just was cutting out a little. Um, and then the next question is kind of perfectly um, goes into um, like the Black Lives Matter. It's what do you say to people who counter the phrase Black Lives Matter with All Lives Matter? And I'll start with Ori for this one. So let me try just my photo to see if that helps any. So uh, there are so many different ways I use. Um, one is if you have someone saying save the whales, you wouldn't say all mammals count because it's the whales that are being killed. Um, there's, uh, and also depending on who I'm speaking with, if it's someone who's of the Christian faith, I'll use the, the parable from the book of Luke that um, Jesus gives of if a shepherd has a hundred uh, sheep and one goes missing, he's willing to leave the other 99 exposed to go save the one because it, it, they all count, but they're, the, that one is, is the one that's lost. And uh, the other one that I uh, would use more, which is uh, I believe more impactful, is what if we lived in a housing development where the houses are very close together. One, one house catches fire. From that fire, the close the nearby houses start catching fire and the firefighters are summoned. How weird would it be if people on the other side of the housing development started saying, hey, my house is just as valuable and looks just as nice and just as much at risk. So please douse that, you know, all the, all the houses, not just the one that's on fire because we're all valuable. So those are the, the main ways. Uh, thank you. And I hope that was better without the... <laughs> yes, <laughs> you didn't cut out. So that's great. Um, yeah, and then uh, Blaze. So my response to when people say Black Lives Matter, then they say all lives matter. Well, all lives won't matter until Black Lives Matter. So it's that simple. Um, and I don't know, people get really hung up on this, but Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that all lives don't matter. They're just not the topic of discussion right now. Um, and no offense to you, Ori, but like people like to use all these different analogies and stuff to like make people understand it. But it's like, why do I have to reduce my life to like some story so you can maybe understand it? Like, no, me saying that Black Lives Matter shouldn't be so much of an argument. You know, like I shouldn't have to reduce it to like, I don't know, some reference or riddle or something for you to be like, oh, I guess that makes sense. Like, I don't know. I, I just feel like people who try to counter that, like you're not helping anything. You're not even helping all lives if you're not helping Black lives. Like, that's why it's just so counterintuitive to me. Um, so, you know, when people say, oh, all lives matter, all Black lives matter. Thank you very much. That's what I would say to them. <laughs> My response to that is, you're when when people say that. My my response is you're intellectually dishonest. It's it's as simple as that. Um, I get that you don't want to deal with the issue of racism. I, I get that you don't want to give up your white privilege. I, I get all that, but don't be dishonest. Um, I don't think that you're stupid and please don't or perceive that I am. When we talk about Black Lives Matter, what we're saying is that systemically, we are seeing the scale tilted in one direction. That, that, that's what we're saying. And, and, and you, because of the privilege that is afforded to you, you can see it also. And 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 it, and it is it is unjust and it is amoral to accept that premise as being acceptable and is damnable because the only reason that you do is because of the privilege that system affords you. If you flip it, if you flip it, you would find it as intolerable as the other group does because of the burden they bear because of that system being tilted against them. So, you know, I, my, my, my patience with that is, uh, is, is, is very short. And, and I thank God that today, America's patience with that is at a wit's end. 
Thank you. Um, and this will be our final question um, that the committee has prepared. So if the audience wants to start directing questions in the chat towards me, um, that would be great. And then we can ask those after. Um, so our final question is about this term colorblindness. We've seen it used. Basically, it's that people don't see color. Um, and so I wanted to ask uh, the panelists, what is your opinion on colorblindness? And I will start with Pastor Jones. Color blindness. Um, I, don't, I don't think that we will, we're gonna always see color. It's, it's natural. I, 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 I think that the fact that we do is part of the richness of who we are is that we can see color. Is when, is, is when color becomes a determining factor in how we treat somebody, that's when it becomes wrong. It becomes unrighteous. And so um, from, a, from a color blindness, I don't think we should, we, we, we should focus so much on, on color, color blindness as as, as in terms of the physical color, but we should focus on color blindness in terms of the behavior we have as a society, as companies, as schools. And, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was in a, a meeting with someone and um, they, they mentioned that I'm not sure that if we can make things change because of the way people's hearts are. And I, and I thought about that, and I thought, I don't really care how, what your heart is as long as you don't mistreat me. Because your heart, I figure that's between you and God. But the way you treat me, that's between you, me, and the societal laws in which we live. And so um, I think that what, what we have to do as it relates to color blindness is we have to have mechanisms, procedures, policies, and laws in place that say you have to treat each other in a measure of respect or else the law comes into play. And, and then the, the rest of it will take care of itself. That's the, that's the color blindness that I think we need in society, a, 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 a system of policies, procedures that says, we will that that there, there are things that that people do because another of another person's ethnicity or color, and therefore we're going to make that illegal. Thank you, and Ori. So I know it's going to sound rather cynical, but I believe color blindness is a good sentiment, but it's definitely probably never going to happen, especially in a culture where we glorify differences. Uh, my great grandfather was from Ireland, but if I walk around in a kilt, everyone would be like, oh my gosh, there's a black man in a kilt. You know, it wouldn't be, you know, just something simple as there's a human being in a kilt, he's probably Irish descent. Like, no, it's like you, they identify Irish with whiteness. And that's the, the, the fact that there's, there are novels uh, or there's books about how the Irish became white because they weren't considered white in, you know, when uh, the United States were first founded. That's something that changed over time. So how people are viewed changes. And this, the way things are right now, there could never, I don't feel that as um, Pastor uh, Jones was saying, it's more of a stop racism rather than a, I'm going to not see you as a black person because that means you're seeing me as a white person you know, default white, which is still a problem because you're going to say that there's so many other attributes that means that because you are now default white that you have to go with. And I've had so many people try to say, oh, well, things are equal because I'm, uh, we're mostly um, colorblind until black people start met, uh, saying that there's a problem. You know, it was black people who started the racist argument which is incredibly offensive. It's, uh, from, it's, it's like, how dare you? And if there is a problem, 
then it's uh, apparently black people who have to say so because it's affecting black people. You, the reason why you don't see it is because of white privilege. And uh, I have had people try, well, I've had this happen to me. I've had this happen to me. I'm like, okay, are you being killed in the street for your skin color? Tell me that. Then once you, um, you know, say I'm being killed in the street for, uh, for my skin color, then okay, there is a problem, but that's going to be another law enforcement problem. When people say, oh, well, uh, white people are killed by cops too. It's like, well, is that okay? Why are you okay with that? You, you shouldn't be going out of your way to justify that it's not racism in that sense, but try to remove racism as a whole. And thank you. Thank you, and Blaze. So, you know, when people say, you know, I don't see color, I don't see color, and they, they usually say something like, I don't care if you're black, blue, purple, orange, green, and start naming all the colors of the rainbow. They're like, I don't care who you are. I love everyone, or whatever they say. You know, like, that's, that's cool. That's great for you. But at the same time, you're ignoring the problem completely. You know, people's ethnicity is a part of who they are. And just ignoring that, you're ignoring the source of the problem. We're getting treated this way because we are Black. That's it. There's no logical explanation because racism isn't logical. So you can see that I'm Black and you can see that I'm not afforded, you know, the same privilege, rights, opportunities, and respect as other demographics or are the same as white people so again like it's your job to realize that like within yourself be like okay i'm okay with this like i realize this get comfortable with it number two acknowledge it speak about it in public spaces like i was saying earlier tell your friends tell your family and three do something about it like you don't have to go and protest um out in the streets to help the movement you know, you talking to your family, that's good. You know, like Pastor Jones was saying, there's a billion different ways for you to help the movement. It doesn't look any particular way. So I just think the whole colorblindness thing is really an ignorant way of thinking because you're ignoring the root of the problem. So um, people that think like that, I don't know, you just got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable until you get with the program. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I think about colorblindness. Thank you, and thank you all for your answers to our prepared questions. Um, so I received one um, audience question that I'm gonna ask in a minute. We also have time for another one. So if anyone wants to um, write me in the chat a question, I can ask that to them as well. And then uh, we'll give uh, each of the participants time for any closing statements. They may have felt they didn't get to add um, to this conversation yet. So the question is, what is your opinion of people such as Dave Chappelle making jokes regarding the black community and experience? And do you feel there's a space for this in the media or does it only add to the issue of systemic racism? And I will start with Ori this time. I didn't even know Dave Chappelle was still a thing. Like <laughs> that, that's from, I was in high school when I last time I heard that name. <laughs> um, but uh, Dave Chappelle, he, I would say it would be almost akin to Tyler Perry. And the Tyler Perry panders to black people, they say, in a, in a different way. So there's always black people who will appeal to the black community in different ways. You know, whether it's um, Tyler Perry is loved it, you know, by a bunch of people, but there are still black communities and uh, white communities who say he's pandering. And you know, no matter how good he's doing, it's still targeted uh, an idea to make money. So if you're going to identify Dave Chappelle, you have to also identify so many other people who's making money off the, the Black stereotype or the Black way of life, quote unquote. Thank you. And Blaze. Yeah, I pretty much feel the same way as Ori. You know, like, he makes money off of you know black stereotypes and you know people can say like oh he's just like appealing to you know a black audience or relating to them or talking about you know how we grew up or or making light of i don't know the the plight that we face or whatever i don't know it i don't really agree with it personally because it's the fact that we're still in the throes of everything and it's like you're making jokes like this or you're making movies 
like this um it's like it's not helping anything you're you're opening up like it doesn't matter if your audience is supposed to be black people everyone can see that and so you're having people who haven't even accepted the fact that they have privilege or that they could be helping a movement or doing something positive and they're sitting there in a theater or in an audience laughing at black people Mm-hmm. And, or laughing about like oh fried chicken and watermelon and like all these different stereotypes like that's not okay you know and I understand that everyone obviously everyone can do what they want to do and that's what Dave Chappelle has chosen to do that's what Tyler Perry has chosen to do uh, but do I agree with it personally no because even though like I said, they can say, oh, this is for a Black audience. They know that white people are watching and laughing. They know that other races, you know, aren't laughing with us. They're laughing at us. Um, and some people, you know, it just reinforces the stereotype. They think Black people are truly like that. So I do think that it's harmful, ultimately. Thank you. And Pastor Jones. It's, it's, it's your business. <laughs> it's um I, I look at it as a show business. It's it's not it's not serious um you know conversation or dialogue. And uh, these guys make a living by being um you know on the edge of um sentiment and, and on and on the edge of public opinion and they, they even though they themselves may not be they, they make a living by doing that and if you if you actually form your political views listening to Chappelle, uh, Chappelle <laughs> or Rush Limbaugh I think I don't really think there's anything I can say to help I really don't Thank you. Um, so I don't have any other questions that have been directed to me in the chat. Um, I, I have. I have oh, a, okay. Um, so Cecil says, um, I think we're not fighting for civil rights. Now we are fighting for human rights. And um, wants to know if the panelists would agree. I, I think. I think he's dead. I think he's dead right. Um, in, in, in the 60s, we, we knew that, that because it was so raw and, and, and because the lines were very rightly drawn as far as uh, what side you were supposed to be on the other side, you know, and, 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 and we knew it was like an apartheid system. So we, you can fight that. Uh, what we look at today and we look at the mass movement of people, black and white, Hispanic. Uh, Asian, and then and then we look at it across the, the, the globe. It, it tells us that this is this is bigger than just a racial issue. It's it's a human issue, and 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 it's not because if it's a race issue, then it becomes just a race against another one. But but the the, the way that this is framed. It, it, it looks, if you think about it, it looks almost akin to the same thing when the Berlin Wall came down and, and people across the world celebrate. And, and you look at this, it's, 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 it's a, it, it looks almost as if the, the, the people that rise up against a totalitarian system of injustice to tear it down. And, and I, when I hear stuff like defund the police, which I do think that there needs to be some restructuring of police funding, but it's and and, and across across the board. I mean, I'm thinking, what does England got to do with Minneapolis? But they're as passionate. I've read some of the articles from it. They're as passionate, and what they're saying is that a system that we pay for that is set up against us and to the degree it can actually take the, the, the most precious thing that we have away from us without any redress whatsoever is fundamentally wrong. And that, that's, that's a human issue. And, 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 and I think also as a, as, as a people, 
we all not to miss this point. And I'm talking about what you talking about America. We talk about uh, Europe, uh, Asia. I, I think we all not to miss this point. When those kids died in Tiananmen Square, uh, and because the system that was set against them, I think you're seeing sort of the same kind of pushback to say, you know, as human, we 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 deserve a better system than this. Thank you, and Blaze. So I definitely agree. Um, and it makes me think about um, one of the events that UTA held. We held a town hall conversation over Black Lives Matter um, that was hosted by our um, interim president. And they asked me to speak. And so one of the things I said is that people are seemingly making this a political problem, but it's not because it's our lives. We live this. This is our experience on a daily basis. This is not an issue of Republican versus Democrat. This is not a policy problem. So that's, I think that's one of the most infuriating things. Um, you know, like my life is not a, a political issue. It's not something to be debated. Like we're, demanding change, we're demanding action. Um, I mean, we've been constantly trying to do this for years. And like, I feel like finally, like there's a huge like call for change all across the country. A lot of people are saying bigger than ever before, people are coming together and demanding change. So I feel like, yeah, it's definitely human rights. It's, it's not a political issue. Um, so it should be treated as such, you know, it should be treated to that degree of importance and people, politicians, government, all that, they shouldn't be dragging their feet on it and, I don't know, weighing their options as if they're, you know, kind of like betting on our lives. Like, well, if we do this and it's going to affect this and that, like, that is so wrong. That's definitely one of the things that needs to be changed. But, you know, in due time, we hope. And Ori. Sorry, making sure that my camera's okay. Uh, because of my past being, you know, all this, um, you know, concentric circles of problems, my major was humanitarian uh, affairs at UNT because I feel like, again, there's so, so many issues that compound other issues that don't just affect one group, but affect multiple groups. I uh, saw today that the Uyghur people who's an ethnic minority in China are being uh, giving forced sterilization. And that re instantly made me think about the forced sterilization in the uh, American South to black women to the point where when they went for surgery, they were given hysterectomies regardless of what their surgery actually was. They were just given, you know, they would wake up and be like, oh yeah, we did this to you by the way. So there's, and I, again, this is one thing that frustrates me on why I don't uh, see how so many other people don't see that this is, we are human beings. Uh, Malcolm X, before he, uh, he was assassinated, was going to take the, um, the Black issue to the UN to, uh, to um, testify saying that America needs to be held accountable for the treatment of Black people, just like any other nation will be accountable for the treatment of any other race. And George Floyd's uh, brother went to the UN recently and I believe that is like definitely a first step because that is a, you know, uh, after his um, Malcolm X's death, I'm surprised no one else thought about taking it to the UN and making this a global issue because this is, we are uh, any other country uh, like anyone else. And if we truly are American exceptionalists, then we should be going above and beyond the correction of what ne what's, um, needs to be done and correction for the past. So definitely a human rights issue. Thank you all. Um, and Cantor Allen's husband has a question. I'm going to let him um, ask it because I feel like it would be very well worded from him. Oh, uh, I'll just read what I wrote. Uh, do you, okay, do you still, do you think that today the differences in terms of racism are regional as they once were South and North were supposedly so different? Do you think there are still are regional differences? And do you think there are particular aspects of racism in Texas that are particular to Texas? And then how would we approach those since we're Texans? 
Thank you. Um, let's start with Ori this time and go reverse. Um, I would say that would go towards more uh, the society. I believe that racism is across the, the board because technically it always was throughout the entire United States. It just was more open in the American South. And I believe the way things again are on, in the media and how uh, black people are seen even in like uh, Southern congregations, um, no matter what your uh, religion is, uh, there's still like an idea of being segregated religiously and saying that's okay. And uh, I know that's a whole nother issue, but there still are small bits of segregation that both sides are okay with that uh, uh, would give the question of why are we okay with this um, in the sense of if we all worship the same being, then we should still come together regardless of the culture, regardless of any other um, you know, issue. And while again, it's different in California, New York, there still is racism in the sense of if you go to New York and see a black man walking down the street, there's people still walk across the and um, you know, because they're afraid that they're about to be mugged. So there's still um, a problem no matter where you go, you just see differently of what people have become, again, okay, normalized with. Thank you. Thank you, and Pastor Jones. Um, the, the, the question of racism in across the board, is it more in one regional than, than the other? Um, there are different types. There, there, there are different types uh, from one area to the other. Now, you take folks from one area and where they experience racism and then transport them to another region of the country just because of the severity of where they, are, where they were compared to where they're going. They might think, man, this is heavy. <laughs> if you, don't, you, you, you knew where I came from, the stuff we put up with compared to here. But, but, but the people there, because of um, man's desire for justice, they would say, yeah, but it's still not right. And it's, it's, it's almost like having a, a, a white sheet and somebody puts a, a, a blot on it, uh, a purple dot, instead of black dot, purple dot. And you ask them, what do you see? And they'll tell you, a purple dot. You, you don't see the white sheet? I mean, 99% of the page, the white sheet. And they say, no, it's that, it's that dot. Now, there's nothing wrong with their eyesight. They're supposed to see the imperfection. And, 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 they're, and, and they're supposed to be repulsed by the imperfection. So whether we're talking about one part of the country that is not as, uh, it's not as obvious or egregious, it's still an imperfection that needs to be fixed. Um, now, when we, 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 we talk about Texas, because I, I worked um, with the uh, district attorney on some issues as it relates to the um, imperfection in Texas. And, and when, when I did, um, I actually went in with the um, uh, NAACP president and with um, uh, another board member to talk to the district attorney. But when I went in, I made sure that I had all of, all of these statistical data that I needed. And, and, and in this encounter, what uh, came out is in, 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 in her discussing it, we went through the round robin of the emotionalism and, and everything. But because of where I'm from, I just listened. And then the DA asked me, well, Pastor, what is it that you want? And I said, well, I, I just want to, I want to, uh, I want a special prosecutor. I knew that I wasn't going to get one because state law didn't really uh, allow that. But I threw it out there anyway. And she bristled and said, you're not going to get that. I said, okay. But then, then she did come back with some things that she was willing to negotiate on. And I said, if you give me this and this, and, and one of them was, you know, the prosecutor. She said, you know, I got a, I got, I got a team of prosecutors. And, and I'll let you guys, you know, I'll let you guys have some input in who that prosecutor's going to be. And one of them was a black lady. 
She said she's like a rock star. Other ones know the white gentleman. He doesn't lose very often. Which 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 one would you like to have? And I, and 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 the the president in NAACP, she said I like to have the black one. And the other board member said that would be good. And I did. I shook my head. And she said, Well, Pastor, what is it that you want? I said, I don't want a black prosecutor. And I don't want a white prosecutor. I want the prosecutor who will not lose. That's the one I want. Because it doesn't matter what their skin color is. I know that a prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. So I want you, is what I was telling her. I want you to make sure that your people go into that courtroom and do their job. And when I want, and when they walk out of that courtroom, I don't want anything less than a prosecution. I don't want anything less than that person being held over to the trial. That's what I want. She said, then if that's the case, then you want the white guy. I said, then that's the guy I want. And, 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 and this is what happened. Because when she asked me, why, was, why did I not have faith in our office? I don't, I don't have any faith in your, your office or anybody else. I said, why? I said, because I had one of my, my social scientists who was, uh, went to UTA working on a master's. She looked up the statistics. And in the last 70 years, until these guys were held accountable for killing a guy in Arlington Jail, in the last 70 years, no one in law enforcement had been held accountable for the death of a person of color in the last 70 years. And for the first time, when these jailers were held accountable and, 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 had, and, and were held over after grand jury and then taken to trial because of that, that was the first time that happened in 70 years. So is there racism in Texas? Yeah, yeah, there, there is. We just don't hear about it because Texas is so big, but it's here. It's, you look at the stuff that happens in Dallas, um, it's here. And it's as bad as the rest of the country. Thank you, and Blaze. Um. So yeah, I definitely think that you could say that there are regional differences. Um, and it makes me think of a conversation that I have with my sister. You know, we're both from Texas, um, but she's lived in California for like the past 15 years or so. And we were talking about protesting. I was like, yeah, I've been protesting and doing stuff. And she was like, oh, that makes me so happy. And like, we were talking about, you know, what we see and stuff. I was like, yeah, you'll see Confederate flags all the time, MAGA hats, you know, people, you know, with all these kind of different things, you know, protesting the removal of Confederate statues and, you know, changing the names of like Confederate heroes um, and whatnot. Um, and she's like, oh, no, you would never see a Confederate flag here. You know, we don't do that out here. We don't stand for that. I'm like, yeah, you probably wouldn't see a Confederate flag in California because the racism like there takes on different forms. Like you still have redlining. You still have food deserts. You still have like unequal opportunities for education. Like it's all still there. It's just the culture is different in the South. It's different in Texas. So are you, you're going to have those people, you know, defending, you know, the Confederacy and waving the flag and whatnot. So yeah, it's definitely different. And I'd say more in your face. And, it, you know, she was talking about, you know, like how people are, you know, in LA and Hollywood, very glitz and glam and stuff like that. So she was like, you'd never see anybody even if they are like a Trump supporter she was like you never see anyone wearing a MAGA hat because they're like oh no it's too it's beneath me kind of thing the very like very much of that elitist you know thinking um and stuff like that but like Pastor Jones was saying it's everywhere and it's in Texas and it's in our community at UTA in Arlington. So people like to glaze over that fact and they're like, oh, all this stuff going on in the world, it's so horrible. I'm like, well, it's not some faraway land, it's right outside. <laughs> like it's in our community, you know? So yeah, it takes on different forms, but you don't have to look very far to find it. You don't have to look very far at all. Thank you all. Um, and since we're scheduled to end at nine, um, I will see like if anyone wants to 
uh, raise their hand, like either on the virtual feature, or just put it up and I can look. Um, if there's any like final question that you feel like you really need to ask. Um, just look through the screens. Okay, um, so yeah, I just wanted to then end um, by just going through the participants and giving them um, kind of an opportunity to say anything else that they feel like they didn't get the opportunity to share um, during this discussion. Um, and I want to sincerely thank you all for giving us this opportunity to just listen to your voice. Um, it's so important that us as a congregation and just a community can hear from different members um, right around, you know, in the neighborhood. And I think it's so valuable um, for me personally, too, just to hear being in the education system. And I think it can help us all. So I appreciate your voices. I appreciate your honesty and your openness. Um, and I will go in the order we did introductions. So I will start by letting Ori speak if he has anything to add. Uh, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, this is uh, definitely something that I've been thinking about since Sherry asked me to do this. And uh, I thank her for this because I don't know how, especially during the pandemic, the fact that there's a group asking for Black voices and hearing, wanting us to be as honest as possible. That is um, something that you don't normally uh, get to hear. And I um, definitely want to thank everyone for that. Uh, during the time of slavery, it was let my people go. And even during the, this uh, Jim Crow era, it was let my people go. I believe we've entered a time of not only let my people go, but a time of like Esther, where I need to stand up for my people. No matter, you know, I may not have that many talents, I will do just because of my skin, because of who I am, I need to go before, you know, the people in authority before anyone say, these are my people. You know, they don't, they're human beings. They don't uh, do anything that the media says. They don't do anything that uh, you've been told. Here's who we are and please have mercy upon them. And may that mercy extend not only to us, but everyone, because we're all a people. Uh, I remember seeing um, something recently about Ethiopian Jews in Israel uh, having issues, and uh, someone left a comment saying, but they're Ethiopian Jews, not American Blacks. They're good for Israel. It's like, whoa. So they've, it's like, how can they have divided so much of it specifically Black Americans that are the bad people? And that's something that I will never um, stop fighting to make sure that is corrected so that everyone can stand up regardless of who they are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Pastor Jones. Now, I would, I would say that one, I have appreciated being in a part of this panel with, with Blaze and Ori. I consider it an honor, given the, the things that the young people are doing today that is making uh, a significant difference. And many of them are going out and they're marching in uh, a situation that um, is going to make this world, this country, uh, and I'd say this world a better place uh, for me to sail off into the sunset with, but also for themselves as well as for their children. So, you know, and, and especially when you look at the pandemic condition, and yet they come together uh, when we organized the march um, here in Arlington and someone asked me about it. One of my clergy friends asked me, you know, Pastor, what about the, the, the pandemic and the uh, COVID-19? And I said to them that there is another virus that is more lethal than COVID-19. And that's the virus of racism. And that next day, actually, it was reported that there were many of the epidemiologists that were saying, actually, and social, social scientists that were actually saying the exact same thing, that this virus or racism is more deadly than COVID-19. And given, given this, this, the option between the two, that they, still, that they themselves would come out and march and demonstrate because of 
the devastating effect that racism has on the American family, our society. Uh, but with that being said, having a, a little bit more time uh, under you know, my belt than, than they have, and looking at world history, history as a whole, especially from the 60s and up to now, you know, I, I look at this moment from where we are in, in the light of the um, uh, World War II and the atrocities that were committed and then the fall of the Berlin Wall and the atrocities that were uh, committed, um, especially uh, with the conflict between the Serbs and the Croats. And then I, I look at this moment in which we, we're in right now. You know, I'm no fan of our current president. Um, but he's not the guy. I mean, I want to see him gone come November. But, but he's not the guy that I'm afraid of. It's the guy that follows him. And right now, because I think this is what I think this is what our world is saying, and I and I think the rest of the world gets it. Is that if we do not deal with this right now, there's another guy who's going to follow him, and the consequences of that guy will be devastating on our world, on our world. And so when I look at what Ori Blaze and their generation is doing, they are going and they're taking the fight in the street against this system, which that guy is hoping to continue to uh, perpetuate on the um, reemerge on the American system and then across the world stage. And I think what their generation is doing is pushing back and saying, we'll have none of it. And for that, I'm grateful. So thank you. Thank you. And Blaze. So first, of course, I want to say thank you to everyone, the congregation, Pastor Jones, Ori, Colette. Like, y'all have been great. It's been great being on the panel with y'all. And I'm really appreciative to be a part of this. You know, um, being the student body president at UTA right now, as you can imagine, is pretty crazy. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, within the school and then current events, of course, affecting us. And so I've been asked to speak about Black Lives Matter, protesting, do interviews a countless amount of times already. And a lot of the times it just feels like, people want to get that story because that's what's going on right now and they want to talk about this so they can oh yeah you're the student body president and I know in the back of their mind they're like and you're black too you're perfect for this and it's like okay yeah I am but you can feel when it's not genuine you can feel when they're just trying to appease everyone and you know kind of make it look like they're doing more than they really are um so it was great to be a part of this um, and to just have a genuine conversation for people to ask questions, listen, us to answer questions, and just give my genuine opinion. Because um, even though, like, for example, like at school, I'll be talking with administrators about, you know, all the stuff that's going on. And they'll basically be like, I hear what you're saying about Black Lives Matter and how we need to do more at school but our focus right now is reopening in the fall and it's just like okay all right reopening first black people second that's that's fine but it's like of course it's not um so it's nice to you know have y'all reach out during this time and really want to listen and and learn um and hear us speak you know so i really appreciate that um again this has been a great experience i think since all this craziness started and since I've been president, which has only been about two months, but this is definitely my favorite event that I've done over Black Lives Matter and talking about everything. Um, again, thank you everyone. This was a really great experience. Um, I want to also thank our amazing 
panelists, speakers, Pastor Jones, Ori, Blaze, you, you know, each of you had such powerful points to make and they were each, you know, in ways they, they were similar, but you also have very um, specific points of view, you know, and maybe that's, you know, difference in generations or age or whatever, but it was really interesting hearing all of your perspectives and, um, you know, and, you're, and, and you all, you're right. <laughs> so that, that I really, I really thank you for sharing um, your personal stories with all of us and, um, and your suggestions and giving us some things to really think about. As I've mentioned before to this congregation, this is a conversation that I want to keep going. This is not just something for this moment because this moment, you know, is, 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 it's not just a moment, okay? And so I, we plan to do other conversations, programming, action steps, um, until we really see some change. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I'm committed to. So I want to remind all of you to please put on your calendars if you haven't already on July 9th. And this is actually thanks to Pastor Jones. Pastor Jones invited me to um, be a part of the Arlington Ministerial Association um, where clergy meets you know, regularly with um, city council, with the mayor, uh, police chief. And I went to my first meeting last Friday and requested a meeting with um, Mayor Jeff Williams, who said, sure, when? And so that is going to be July 9th at 10 a.m. Please put that on your calendar. And um, I think we even got a Zoom link this morning on, uh, with that. We will have a chance to really ask him about, I believe there's a task force that he is forming, again, to investigate um, you know, these issues and to put some policies in place. Um, if you have questions that you want to ask, please email them to me uh, or to one of the members of our social justice committee, um, and we will make sure that we get those questions to him. Later in that day, Puck Glass is going to be moderating a book club group on the book that hopefully all of you are reading or have finished reading called The Fire This Time by Jessamyn Ward, which is a brilliant book. Um, so. We'll be talking about that that evening. So two events in the same day. Um, and then, Blaze, I think you mentioned the movie 13. Wonder, an amazing, it's actually, it's, it's, it's a documentary, really. It's not, and it is just, it will, it will leave you drained. It will, you'll be crying, you'll be, you know, you'll be speechless and it will affect you. And I'm trying to see if there's some way that perhaps this can be something that we do as a congregation too, that we zoom in to watch this movie together and talk about it because I think it's a very, very important film. So we will be having, you know, programming on into the future and um, hope you guys are all along for the ride. Um, we've been very motivated here tonight by these wonderful, uh, wonderful human beings that have chosen to spend their night with us. And for all of you to, that have chosen to spend your night with us too, I thank you. Back to, back to Colette for some closing words. Mm. I want to thank Colette too for moderating this. Obviously this was a, this is a, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to juggle all this and Colette, you did a great job. So thank you. Thank you, Kanner Allen. And thank you everyone. Just reiterating what she said. Um, we're so appreciative to have this conversation. You know, it makes me so happy to hear Blaze say stuff like um, how meaningful this is, you know, for her too. And that this is a good conversation. And um, I think that's what it is. It is a conversation to be continued. As Kenner Allen said, you know, it's not a moment. It's not a trend. It's something that is real. Um, you know, the panel's saying it's their lives. It's not something that we can just have trending on Twitter and then it goes away. So we need to keep uh, discussing. Please come to the event on July 9th, both events on July 9th. And keep your eye out because this will not be the last event we host. You know, the social justice committee, we want to keep conversations going. And if you have any suggestions too for um, issues or programs that you want to see our congregation talk about, I would love for you to email me as well. Um, so thank you again and uh, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for being here.